Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's OSA Technical Group webinar, The Blue Light Hazard, What Does It Really Mean? My name is Hannah Walter Pylon, and I'll be moderating this webinar on behalf of the Optical Society. We are very excited to have John O'Hagan from Public Health England joining us for this webinar, which was organized by the OSA Color Technical Group. OSA Technical Groups aim to create vibrant and active communities for all of our members to participate in. OSA offers members more than 40 different technical groups, which focus on select fields of optics. And each of these groups are led by OSA members who volunteer their time to organize engaging events tailored to your interests, such as today's presentation. You can learn more about all of our technical groups and find out about our upcoming events by visiting osa.org slash technical groups or by connecting with us on LinkedIn or Facebook at any time. Before we begin today, I wanted to note that we will be addressing your questions at the end of the webinar. We encourage you to submit questions for our presenter throughout the webinar, and you can do so by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You will then be able to submit your questions in the pop-up box. At the end of the webinar, we hope you will take a minute to provide us with your feedback by completing a short survey. You also will be able to download a PDF copy of today's presentation directly from the survey page. This webinar is being recorded and a copy of the slides and a link to the recording will be emailed to you following the conclusion of the webinar. Now it's my pleasure to welcome Manuel Spichon, who leads our color technical group. Manuel will tell you a bit more about the group and he will introduce you to today's presenter. Manuel, if you want to start sharing your desktop. Okay, um, good morning, good, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Hannah, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Manuel Spichon, and on behalf of the OSA Color Technical Group, I welcome you all very warmly to today's webinar on the blue light hazard. I'm especially excited as this is the first webinar organized by the Color Technical Group, and I hope it's gonna be one of many to come. The Color Technical Group's activities are led by an amazing executive committee who I'm fortunate to work with. This committee consists of Rick Mobaras, John Hardeberg and Francisco Imai. So what do we actually do as the color technical group? Our focus is on all aspects related to the physics, physiology, and psychology of color in biological and machine vision. And our mission is to really benefit you. And we do this through webinars such as today's, but also through social media engagement, publications, technical events, special sessions, and other outreach activities. You can find us on the OSA website, on Twitter, using the hashtag um, OSAColorTG, as well as on our LinkedIn group. Um, as a preview, I'd also like to make you aware of our next webinar, uh, taking place on the 30th of January of next year. This webinar will be delivered by Professor Maureen Knights and hosted by Enrique Mobaras. Without further ado, it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce today's speaker, Dr. John O'Hagan. Uh, John heads the Laser and Optical Radiation Dosimetry Group at Public Health England and is the Vice President of Standards at the CIE. I'm grateful for John that he delivers, he agreed to deliver this webinar today. I'm looking forward to the next hour or so uh, learning about the blue light hazard. Uh, John, take it away. Thank you, Manuel. I'll just uh, share my screen. Okay, well, hello, hello everybody, uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, Manuel and I are both in the UK, so it's very dark here, it's 5 p.m. Uh, for those of you in the, the States, hopefully you've still got some light. Uh, this is what we're obviously gonna talk about is that the blue light um, has a, and I'm doing this in my role as CIE Vice President of Standards and not as an employee of Public Health England, although I will refer to some of uh, the data that myself and my colleagues have, uh, have worked out uh, over the years. So everyone else has done their adverts. I'm now going to do the advert about the CIE. And uh, for, to introduce CIE, for those of you who are not familiar with the organization, uh, it's a little bit older than, than the OSA and uh, really started in 1900 with the International Commission on Photometry, which itself was formed from the International Gas Congress. In 1913, uh, the uh, CIE was uh, formally formed, a very small group of uh, a few countries. And uh, its name, CIE, is obviously from the French Commission Internationale de la Crage. Uh, 
Uh, it's a technical, scientific, and cultural nonprofit organization, and uh, it develops uh, various products that uh, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, the Central Bureau, very small uh, permanent staff, is located uh, in Vienna, in Austria, and there's a photo of, uh, of our headquarters um, building, and uh, we occupy uh, one floor of that. CIE itself um, is made up of membership of countries, so individuals do not belong to CIE. It's uh, various uh, national committees uh, throughout the world, and this is just a few of them with their, their logos. Um, so my one is, is down here. Oops, let's go back a slide. Is um, down here uh, for CIE UK, but uh, because CIE US is up there as, as well. Uh, our technical work is done uh, in six divisions. You'll notice there's no division five and no division seven. Uh, division five was merged with division four and division seven was more to do with uh, general lighting, which is now spread across divisions three and four. Uh, it covers a whole range of um, issues to do with uh, light and lighting, the science, art and everything to do with lighting. And uh, for eight years, I was uh, director of Division 6 Photobiology and Photochemistry, which is one of the reasons why I am uh, giving this talk. Hopefully it's not affecting you too much, but being in the UK, it started to rain and I'm in a, my office has a metal roof, so I can hear the, the rain pattering on the roof there. In terms of uh, deliverables, uh, we've in the last two years produced 22 new publications and they can be uh, seen from our website organized 12 conferences and workshops over the last four years. CIE works to a four year um, time period, of what's called a, a session, a quadrennial session being the meeting that we hold every four years. And the last one was in uh, Washington DC uh, this year. We published two position statements this year. One is an update of a, an older one uh, and they're relevant and I'll come back to them at the end of the presentation. We're also recognized as an international uh, standardization um, body by ISO, the International Standardization Organization. And uh, that goes back to 1989 when we were formally recognized as an international standards organization. But this year in Vienna at uh, Austrian Standards, we signed a, a formal agreement with ISO. It's called a Partnership Standards Development, Developing Organization uh, Agreement. And on the right there, you see Sergio Muka who is the uh, Secretary General of ISO with Cathy Neild in the middle, our General Secretary, and me uh, just making up the numbers as uh, Vice President uh, Standards. So let's get on to the business for today. Uh, humans have evolved uh, under the sun. Uh, we're an outdoor species who in only relatively recent times have uh, spent our, our time indoors. The top curve shows the solar spectrum when you're outside the atmosphere, and the lower curve is the uh, solar spectrum measured uh, here in the UK. And it, it stops at 800 nanometers because that's where we uh, stop measuring. But the important point is that most of the solar spectrum that we have evolved under um, is in the visible and the uh, in, in near infrared and far infrared and a certain amount of UV. And we used to see in the spectrum with the uh, with a rainbow, and uh, there are other ways that we can split that light up. And that's that's quite important for us is to be able to split the light up into its individual components, so we can assess uh, the the risks from that. A more challenging question is what is blue light? We're talking about the blue light hazard, but we really need to define what we mean by blue light. And there isn't a strict definition of blue light other than that light is that looks blue. When we look at the sky, we see blue light and, and even on that uh, rainbow, the light above the rainbow is bluer than the light uh, below it. And if you go out on any day, then what we perceive as blue can vary considerably. In uh, 1931, CIE published this uh, color space uh, diagram, which has been, uh, has evolved over the years. And we could say the bottom left-hand corner there is essentially blue, uh, but th there are different hues of blue uh, and are, are different perceptions of blue depending on um, the other lights, light colors around us. And the V-Lander curve uh, peaks at 555 
nanometers in the green and yellow and uh, somewhere to the left there is blue. Uh, again, not well defined. You can look at various websites and they'll give definitions of blue light, but they'll, they'll all be different. In terms of the hazard, uh, we're just saying it's anything that's uh, roughly blue and down into the, um, uh, the violet area. We're used to uh, dealing with um, different levels of light, which is another important factor here. So in low light levels, um, the iris opens up to give us a, a large pupil um, up to seven or eight um, millimeters diameter for a very young. Um, and if we are in bright light, the iris closes down, giving us a smaller aperture and roughly a factor of 16 difference in, in area, uh, allowing a, some restriction of light if it's too bright entering through um, the eye. Because we get too much light, we tend to avoid it. We may not shut our eyes, we might look away, we might put up our hand to shield our eyes, but we don't like bright light. And again, I'll come back to that uh, at the end of the presentation. A quick bit of um, biology of the eye. Uh, light comes in from the uh, left-hand side of the eye ear um, on here and comes in through the front surface. And one of the important uh, parameters here in terms of the amount that gets to the retina is the lens. And then that light goes through to the retina at the, at the back of the eye. We have light sensors here, rods and cones. The rods give us the low light uh, vision and the cones give us high light level vision with color. And in between we have the retinal ganglion cells that uh, we touch on very briefly at the end. Now the back here is uh, retinal pigment epithelium and uh, that's important as well in terms of the potential risk to our eyesight from optical radiation. And if uh, you're not familiar with it, in the middle here is the macula, the piece of the, the retina that gives us a detailed um, vision. We have evolved with lots of different light sources, all of which had some risks associated with them. Where we're using flames, obviously the risk was setting fire to ourselves uh, and to the environment that uh, we had the, the lamps in. Uh, but also when you burn uh, hydrocarbon, you produce fumes and these uh, potentially lead to a risk to us. Uh, one um, quite worrying statistic is in sub-Sahara Africa where they still use kerosene lamps a lot, uh, more people die as a result of um, the effects of the fumes from kerosene lamps than die from HIV AIDS. Gas lamps, um, I think we all like to see these sort of lights. All of these lighting technologies, we can uh, be uh, mesmerized by and sit and stare at them. And uh, gas lamps, we, we like in London, we have still have a, a lot of um, gas lamps run around our Royal Parks, uh, which are maintained uh, very well. But there have always been concerns and uh, there was a bit of a battle with the introduction of electric light. And this is an advert from an Australian uh, magazine from 1928, uh, trying to push a particular uh, type of um, uh, lamp. And you can see there, it talks about electric light and the uh, risk from electric light and the rays that they emit. So this isn't something new but uh, we need to put it in perspective with these um, oil-based and uh, petrol-based um, gasoline-based lamps. Uh, they do um, have uh, adverse health effects associated with them. In terms of the blue light hazard, uh, why is blue light more of a problem than, uh, than red light, for example? This is down to the energy of individual photons. If we now treat uh, light as particles and not waves, then each a uh, photon of light has a, a particular energy um, from that equation there. It's a very simple equation, H equals, uh, sorry, E equals HC divided by lambda, uh, where the parameters that we input into this, particularly H and C are now fundamental constants uh, as a result of the agreement last year um, about the uh, SI units. So we can calculate at, for example, the peak of our eyes response of 555 nanometers, the amount of energy that we have in a single photon, which is not many joules, uh, 10 to the minus 3.58, 3 10 to the minus 19 joules. 
which we can convert into a, a more manageable unit that's used more frequently in ionizing radiation at 2.24 electron volts. Electron volt being the kinetic energy gained by an electron through a potential difference of one volt. And a unit that's uh, used in um, photochemistry is to take the energy in joules, and multiply it by the Avogadro's number, and you can end up with the number of kilojoules per mole of photons. So as we go down in, in uh, wavelength, our energy is going up, and that's important in terms of photochemical um, processes. Because our main worry is the exposure of the retina of the eye, because our light is transmitting through the front surfaces of the eye to the retina. And up until the really 1970s, um, the main concern was about thermal effects. So energy coming in from optical radiation, heating up the retinal tissue to such a level that you get um, uh, damage to that tissue. But William Hamm and his colleagues in the early 1970s uh, were doing research on the effects of uh, different wavelengths on the retina. And this was only really possible now because of the um, introduction of lasers where you could choose individual wavelengths. And what they discovered was that there were effects that were clearly not heating effects. Uh, and they, they showed that the evidence for photochemical damage, recognizing there was probably some synergy between heat and the photochemical reaction, because if you warm something up, the chemical reaction possibly goes uh, slightly uh, faster. And uh, photochemical injury of an eye um, looks a bit like this. This is a, a fundus photograph um, looking in through the front of the eye at the, the retina. And you can see the, the strange uh, uh, damage uh, in the middle there. That's photic retinitis. Now what Ham managed to show, and uh, this um, paper is readily available, is that as it came down in wavelength, you needed less um, energy to cause harm. So the different curves, there are different exposure durations, and the um, y-axis is one over the amount of um, energy deposited into um, a unit area. So what he recognized was that as you come down in wavelength, um, the uh, phototoxicity increased, and they put that down to photochemical injuries. Some other fundamental points about uh, photochemistry. If we're now talking about photons of light coming in and causing damage, one of the reasons why higher wavelength uh, light doesn't cause an effect is because it's not absorbed. So a fundamental principle of photochemistry is unless you have an absorption of a photon, you don't get an effect. And that was, uh, that's been known for quite some time. You see that the two um, authors of the papers that uh, um, prove that. Uh, Einstein and uh, Johannes Stark uh, also put forward the um, theory that uh, any one molecule any, will absorb one photon. Uh, now, within reasons, that's true, but of course, we can now, by using lasers, put two photons in at the same time and, and generate a different uh, photochemical reaction. Uh, one that uh, we use quite a lot in, in photobiology and photochemistry is that the outcome from a photochemical reaction depends only on the total energy that's absorbed. So it doesn't matter whether we have a low exposure for a longer period of time or a, shorter, or a higher exposure for a shorter period of time, we get the same effect. And that's called the bunsen roscoe law. Now we shouldn't be worried that we get photochemical reactions in the eye because vision itself is a photochemical process. Uh, and without that, obviously we wouldn't be able to see. So all the time when light has come into the eye, it's generating photochemical reactions uh, which then reverse themselves and we're ready to receive another photon for vision. And that's one of the reasons why the eye is always in motion because the individual receptors uh, have a recovery time. And anyone who tries to stare at uh, an object um, using a telescope or something will discover that they, the vision fades uh, with time. Now, what about how do we define the blue light hazard? having defined that we don't know much about blue light and what we, how we define blue light. What about the blue light hazard? Uh, well, this is defined um, what we call type two photochemical retinal damage. This is damage where you get a high exposure uh, in a relatively short period of time, like a day. And uh, the wavelength region uh, that we're really worried about is 380 nanometers to 550 nanometers. nanometers. So it's extending below um, the vision threshold. 
and importantly, which I'll come back to later on, is for um, the aphakic eye. So we don't have a lens or a lens that's very young, then we, the transmission goes down to 300 nanometers. Uh, CIE uh, on its um, homepage, as you can see the homepage that was actually advertised in this webinar, um, but on the right hand side of the web, uh, web page, there's a link to the um, EILV. ILV is International uh, Lighting Vocabulary, and you can look up these terms. And if you look up blue light hazard, it restricts the wavelength region because in terms of normal lighting, these are the wavelengths that are of, of concern um, for um, people who are observing it. And, and as it says there, we only tend to get the effects if we get an exposure over 10 seconds. Now, most of our experience um, from blue light retinal lesions, uh, where we get damaged to the retinal pigment epithelium, the layer actually behind the um, light sensors, uh, comes from things like people staring at the sun. Uh, an eclipse is a peak time when you get uh, a lot of these um, retinal lesions. Uh, we had a, an eclipse in the UK in 1999, uh, where there were 60 uh, re reported cases of eye injuries as a result of staring at the sun. Um, and they were followed up for six months. And interestingly, they all actually resolved after six months. But the, the reaction that we get is not immediate. So it takes a few hours, um, 12 hours or more for an effect to be seen uh, peaking at uh, between one and two days afterwards. Now the effectiveness of um, creating the harm is dependent on the energy of the photons, but also the transmission of the light through to the uh, retina. So it, it, if it wasn't for uh, the um, attenuation of the light coming into the front surface of the eye, this curve would probably keep going up. So the, this is the what we call an action spectrum for the blue light hazard, which peaks at about 430, 440 uh, nanometers, which tells us that if you've got light at that wavelength, that's the most effective at creating uh, photochemical harm. As we move away from that, the risk goes down. And if you look at it on the log scale, you can see that uh, it really drops off by the time you get up to um, 600 nanometers. So why has this become an issue? Um, what people have done is looked at uh, some of the older LED lighting technology, where you have this giant peak um, in the blue. And that uh, appears to match pretty well with the uh, blue light hazard. Of course, this is a, not only a spectral issue, it's the amount of light that you've got. Uh, and this is what uh, has often uh, been missed with uh, some of the reports about the concerns, particularly with LED lighting. Now, 6000K is not actually a very good measure for, or using the, the um, correlated color temperature is not a very good measure for LED lighting because we can create that um, uh, effective CCT by using a, a range of spectra. But we see lighting advertised with the correlated color temperature. So 6000K will probably be quite uncomfortable for most people. Um, it's, a, it's very white, uh, bright white, um, bluish white light. So where do the actual limits come from? There's another international body, uh, an International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection, uh, which is a body of uh, experts who are appointed based on their expertise and not on um, their affiliation or their country of uh, origin. And uh, the commission of the uh, of ICNA uh, meets regularly to review scientific advice, and it does this through uh, project groups that it appoints to uh, do the scientific reviews. And the most recent um, guidelines for incoherent visible and, and infrared optical radiation was published in 2013. And it publishes um, formula like these, which are on first viewing um, look very daunting, but essentially what it says in the, in the top one, if we've got less than three hour exposure, less than 10,000 seconds exposure, then our limit is uh, a million joules per meter squared per steradium. And that um, means that uh, when we take our exposure, we need to look at the distribution of our uh, optical source as a function of wavelength. And we need to weight each 
um, parameter, each, each part of the spectrum with the blue light hazard function. And then we add it all up, add it up over wavelength and add it up over time uh, up to our 10,000 seconds and see whether we exceed that limit or not. When we go above uh, 10,000 seconds, the um, limit is in terms of uh, radiance, 100 watts per meter squared per steradium. So what that means is uh, we have a limit <clears throat> and we shouldn't exceed that in, let's say, uh, three hours during the day. And it's actually quite difficult to do that. Uh, this plot uh, is what we would call a time waiting average. What we're doing is looking at the amount we get over time throughout the day. And um, for most of us, we do not stare at light sources. We've uh, hopefully learned in, in quite early life that you don't stare at the sun. Uh, you might stare at the sky, but not at the sun. And uh, unless you are a proper lighting geek, which I can be sometimes, you don't stare at the, the lighting um, in your office, at home, or street lights or anywhere like that. Um, so throughout the day, we get a little bit of exposure every now and then. You might just catch a glimpse of the sun, but you don't do it for very long. So the sudden step there might be uh, a quick look at the, the sun. And throughout our day, we are being exposed to light sources um, lots of different light sources, different exposure levels, and um, uh, that builds up. And it's actually quite difficult to get to this limit uh, in normal use. Uh, there might be certain industrial applications where um, there's a source that really does need protection and you might be able to get to that limit. The reason why there's a picture of a little mouse there is uh, research is going on, it continues to go on, uh, as people have been concerned about the blue light hazard, people have gone back to various research groups around the world, have gone back to the uh, fundamentals here and looked at the effect on um, generally rodents uh, on, or on individual cells and looked at the, uh, whether this um, limit is correct. Almost all of the studies that I have looked at have used levels above this limit and they find effects. So that we would expect that because they're above this exposure limit. Uh, the other thing to take into account is that we are not mice, our eyes are different. And also if you do work on cells, the cells don't have the um, repair mechanisms that our, our eyes do. So uh, we're fairly confident that the limit is okay and that nothing is showing us that we should bring that limit down. That may change, obviously that we, we can ne never say never, but there's, at the moment there's nothing to say that this is uh, wrong. When doing actual measurements, uh, we, when looking at a source, uh, if you have a very, very um, high luminance source, a very intense source coming from a very small uh, point in space, then we would average that over 11 milliradian uh, aperture. So we're only gonna collect light from a limited point, but we average it over that um, aperture. And by using these values, which obviously change with time here, go from 11 milliradians up to 110 milliradians, uh, we're widening our aperture as we get to longer times. And that's partly because our eyes uh, are in motion the whole time and, and any source is going to be, um, the exposure from the source is gonna be smeared over the eye. But again, recognizing that most of our exposure comes from reflective surfaces and not from looking directly at the source. So by using that information, one thing we can do to simplify the measurement is to convert the uh, radiance or integrated radiance um, limits into radiant exposure or irradiance. And that's just by cal uh, calculating um, the, um, those values by taking into account the, um, uh, the, the uh, acceptance angle. These just make it easier to do some measurements. The other thing we can do with this is to do a measurement without using um, the normal radiance measurement criteria of, of limiting the uh, field of view and accepting uh, optical radiation from a wider field of view. And if we're still below this limit, we know that if we limited the field of view, we would be even further below the limit. In terms of doing uh, measurements, uh, we obviously need to measure the spectrum unless it's a well-characterized source. Uh, we don't trust the information from um, other people, so we tend to measure them ourselves. And we tend to do measurements with an instrument like this, a double grating monochromator, uh, which steps through and measures each uh, wavelength um, in turn. It takes a while to do it, and it's okay if you've got a static um, uh, 
emission source, but if the source is varying in time, you'd need to use something else. It's obviously important this is calibrated and traceable, uh, obviously depending on what you're doing. A lot of the, the measurements we do could end up in court, so we have to make sure this is a, a traceable uh, measurement. The wig, which I'm showing here are double grating monochromator, or at least one of them. Uh, of course, you can use CCD array um, spectrometers for the um, visible near infrared and get a reasonable answer um, from that. And this is some data from um, two sources, uh, an incandescent light bulb and an LED which is more representative of the sort of LEDs that we certainly have in the European market now, where that blue peak is not as pronounced. Uh, and this would be a warmer light that we tend to be more comfortable with, certainly in our, in our homes. Uh, so what we can do is take that, that's our actual calibrated measurement, that's in real milliwatts per meter squared uh, per nanometer. And we then will weight that with the blue light hazard weighting function. So at each wavelength, we take the value of our um, B lambda curve and multiply it by the value that we measured. And then having got those values, which is the graph here, um, you can see that the, although the LED has a, a, a tighter peak, that the incandescent has a, a broader peak. If we add all those up, we can see uh, what the difference is and actually compare it with the, the um, exposure limit value. And if we do that for some uh, light sources, there are several things that are interesting with this table. One is that IGNERP um, uh, has recommended a trigger level below which you don't need to worry about white light sources. Um, so it's very difficult to uh, prove that you'd actually exceed the exposure limit if you are below this, um, this luminance value. Uh, and if you have an LED, uh, or an incandescent light bulb, or even the compact fluorescent light bulb, they're very bright to look at if they're intended to be uh, illumination sources. Therefore, we, we're exceeding the, um, that uh, trivial, trigger level. But if we take the panel light, um, so this is a 600 mil by 600 mil panel, where the light is diffused and is not coming from a, a single point, then you can see um, its luminance has dropped because the area of emission has uh, dropped and we're below the um, trigger level. But more importantly, in the in the next column, we have um, the blue light blue light weighted radiance, uh, which we would be comparing with the, the value of 100. And you can see that if you were staring at this light source, this is not it just been in the environment. This is actually staring at the light source um, for um, uh, three hours to a day, then you'd be at 20 percent of the limit. Worst case of one LED. And there isn't much difference between the LED and the incandescent light source. Uh, we found that again and again, people who say um, that there's more of a problem with LED lighting, uh, it's only an issue if you, have, if you have these very high blue peak uh, white light sources. For um, a normal source, then um, it's not much different to an incandescent light bulb. Another factor we can calculate is if, if we take our blue light weighted red, blue light weighted radiance and divide that by the luminance of the source, we can get what we term the hazard ratio. And you can see the values are pretty well uh, the same for the uh, first four sources, but for the, the panel it, it's um, higher. So we need more, um, uh, we get more watts out if we um, uh, have the same uh, luminance. Now, when we, look, when we look at normal life, most people don't stare into lights. This is Dave Sliney, which many of you, uh, many of you will know. And he, Rolf Bergman and I, um, produced a, a paper um, which published uh, in Lucos um, to try and dispel some of the myths about um, light technology and the safety aspects of it. Uh, and Dave wanted to prove a point that actually you could not open your eyes in front of that light. And it would be pretty unusual behavior to stare into light as on the left-hand side. What we're generally doing is using a, a, a lamp of for whatever description to illuminate a surface and the light is reflecting off of that into our eyes and it's that that we're getting. And of course the spectrum changes as well as the um, luminance of the uh, reflected surface. So generally we would have lights overhead uh, lighting up um, the work surface. And this is a concept, in, certainly in English law, it's also a concept in um, a number of other countries, is where written in law is common sense. Uh, 
and in English law is the man on the Clapham omnibus, uh, which doesn't mean much to most people these days, but there's a picture of a Clapham omnibus so that you know what one uh, looks like. So the idea is the man in the street uh, or the normal person, what would they do um, and uh, what can we assume about their behaviour? And I think we could generally assume that most people do not stare into light sources because that's uh, evolved over time with our candle or a fire or even our, our gas lamp um, until we have mantle gas lamps. It was quite comfortable to stare at the light source and, and most people find it quite relaxing to stare into a fire or, or at a candle. But as incandescent light bulbs uh, improved in their uh, optical efficiency, uh, we then evolved with uh, frosted glass uh, light bulbs, of course it reduces the efficiency, but uh, makes it a more comfortable source. And of course, then as they got even higher luminance sources, um, we put shades on to uh, avoid our direct exposure. So common sense here um, avoided the, the risk. And one of the problems we had with LED lighting was that some people um, were manufacturing and installing light sources without the prior history uh, of, of lighting design and technology. Now, what I've spoken about up to now has been really to do with the um, our, our exposure. Of course, there is a standard um, in, in IEC. It was a, a CIE standard um, before that uh, to do with phytopological safety of lamps and lamp systems. This is a, a pretty well equivalent to the RP27 series um, uh, published by IES in the States. And we have risk groups. One of the problems that we are facing now is the risk groups were given descriptors that weren't intended to be used as they're used. I haven't put them on here because if you don't know them, I don't want you to know them. Um, but essentially, exempt RG1 and RG2 are safe in normal use uh, because of just the way we behave. It's only risk group three that we uh, worry about. And indeed that's written into European law uh, that we only worry about class three being class four lasers and risk group three non-laser optical sources. But that standard has assessment conditions, uh, which is 200 millimeters for normal sources or 500 lux for um, general lighting. And what that means essentially is if you do the assessment of 500 lux, you will end up with a risk group, um, but uh, 200 millimeters for some sources that are not considered general light. And there's been some misinterpretation of this. This is the assessment distance and not the uh, expected exposure distance of a, a person. So you find there are some sources that people are complaining are risk group two or even risk group three and therefore dangerous, but no one is anywhere near it. This standard is currently being revised within uh, CIE with help with, uh, from IEC. It's useful to put this in perspective uh, because our biggest source of optical radiation for most of us is the sun uh, and the sky. Uh, if we ignore the uh, sun because we're told not to stare at the sun and we shouldn't stare at the sun because that really will cause us harm. But what if we just stare at the sky? Is that a problem? And uh, we did some assessments here. There's a rare picture of the UK um, sky with uh, some um, blue sky in it without clouds. And you can see if you laid on your back and stared up at the sky without looking at the, the solar disk itself, you would uh, be at 10, just over 10% of the exposure limit, the blue light exposure limit. In December, it goes down by back to a factor of three, but not significantly different, actually going from uh, midsummer to uh, uh, midwinter. Then the question is, what about things we stare at? So we stare at our computer screens uh, for a significant amount of time, um, our tablets and uh, phones, uh, and the younger generation probably spend most of the time staring at their phones. Should we worry about that? Well, one of the things that uh, we looked at with this was which color screen should we worry about? And uh, it might be, seem logical, you would uh, worry about a, um, a blue screen. But in fact, the biggest uh, blue light hazard risk uh, comes from a white screen because that has the highest output uh, from crossing over between the, um, the green and the, uh, the blue. And when we look at that, this is a, uh, a computer monitor as opposed to uh, a laptop or anything like that. Um, and we were down at uh, 
you know, less than 1% of, uh, of the limit if you stared at it all day at roughly uh, 30 centimeters from the, the screen, which again is, is rather close than most people would look. If we look at laptop screens, so we've got a full white image on the laptop screen. Um, again, we're well below 1% of the uh, blue light exposure limit. So even if you are right up against the screen um, all day long, for whatever reason, you're never going to exceed the um, blue light hazard. Then tablets, again, uh, very low levels. Um, part of the reason here that they're quite low uh, levels is because um, the luminance is, is quite low because the light has been emitted from a large area. And that's why uh, these are somewhat different to um, a smartphone where you start to creep up a little bit, but not much. And we need to bear in mind that um, if you're with a, a smartphone, one thing you're often critically worried about is battery life. So you tend not to have the screen at full brightness like we did here. Uh, and certainly when it gets dark, hopefully you've got um, management of the luminance on the device to uh, again uh, manage your uh, battery life. All of this data is, is from a paper we produced in uh, 2016, which I think is um, available to download for free. LED streetlights uh, have um, certainly been in the media quite a lot uh, and the potential harm from these. Uh, the biggest problem with LED street lighting is where someone just takes the old um, luminaire off and puts a new one on without considering the uh, light pattern. So it's nothing to do with um, blue light hazard or anything like that. We have assessed uh, a lot of uh, street lights and we have assessed them at 20 centimeters, uh, which is what we consider the worst case for uh, an engineer who was doing some maintenance and for some reason was doing the work at night with the unit on and staring up into the light source. And even there, you cannot uh, reasonably exceed the exposure limit. So for anyone who's any distance from the street light, uh, we didn't think this was a concern in terms of blue light hazard. Clearly, if you've got light shining into your bedroom from a street light outside, that isn't a good idea. You need to find uh, ways of uh, managing that. Another factor in terms of uh, blue light exposure and the blue light hazard is the transmission of light through to the retina, particularly as a function of age. And most of the work that's done tends to take an average age of uh, 32, which is the uh, horizontal line there. As you go down in age, then the blue light transmission increases considerably. And as you go up in age, it decreases considerably. So age 32 is roughly in the middle there. So I'm sitting uh, just below the uh, 60 line there. Uh, so my blue light uh, vision is, is rubbish. Um, but if you have adults design products intended for children that have blue light sources in them, you have the potential for problems. Uh, and I, I had experience that I've been involved with a museum display that used blue LEDs to uh, demonstrate water. And my teenage at the time children uh, came and looked at it and said they just couldn't look at it. It was much too bright. And that's a problem with adults designing stuff for uh, to children. But more importantly, uh, this is recognized by the ICNERP guidelines in that they have this um, different curve when you go um, down in, in wavelength uh, into the violet and um, towards the ultraviolet, where the uh, weighting function uh, goes up to a factor of six. So we tend to apply this by um, dividing the limits by a factor of 10 for uh, children. And this impacts on toys. We've done a lot of work with the toy industry over the years and there's my colleague Michael, who when he first arrived, the first job he had was to assess a lot of uh, toys. And the toy industry is accepting this and uh, it's now relatively unusual to see uh, blue LEDs on toys, but you do see them in many other consumer products. Uh, and that is a concern. There's no reason why you need a blue LED on, uh, on a consumer product uh, when, uh, for example, a green or red will, will do the same job. Coming back to we don't like uh, lights, bright lights in our eyes. When you suddenly have lots of bright lights in your eyes where you didn't have them before, that's bound to cause concern. Uh, if you measure them in terms of blue light hazard, it's not an issue. 
but clearly is an issue in terms of uh, glare and dazzle and sometimes even startle where um, people suddenly get this light in their face and uh, if it's at night it can uh, certainly destroy your, your night vision. Uh, these people who travel around um, wooded areas at night uh, very dark using their uh, lights on their bicycles and on their heads they know not to look into other people's lights otherwise you just can't see afterwards. There of course are issues about the appropriateness of uh, some of this lighting but um, it is not a blue light hazard. And you may hear stories about the, the risk from macular, macular degeneration. Um, it, it, macular generate, degeneration is a concern as we live longer it's a concern it tends to be a disease of age. And what happens <clears throat> is our central part of our vision uh, really stops working. And the image on the right there shows what it looks like uh, looking out. There are a number of epidemiological studies that suggest that uh, exposure to a lot of sunlight um, causes this. We don't yet know which part of that sunlight is the problem. And uh, of course, many of the people who uh, have been involved in these studies, they may be working on water or on snow, other environments where the reflection of, of light towards the eye is different from a normal environment where people are on grass, for example. So we keep this in mind, but I, I would like to stress that there's no evidence that uh, light sources um, cause this effect as opposed to uh, very high levels of exposure to sunlight. There are a couple of uh, other concerns with lighting which I'm going to finish up with but uh, hopefully you'll be subject of other um, presentations uh, later. Uh, one is people who suffer from headaches, migraine, uh, which they are attributing to light sources. Uh, we think this is due to uh, temporal light modulation flicker. Uh, in, the, in Europe there'll be 100 hertz and in the, the US and Japan 120 hertz, so twice the mains uh, frequency. And uh, we don't yet know enough about this to be able to give advice other than to say you probably shouldn't have um, flickering light. And CIE has a research forum, RF2, that's looking at the matters relating to temporal light modulation, uh, which um, uh, you can ask to join and if you have something to contribute to, to the discussion. And the other thing is. Uh, to do with uh, circadian entrainment and everything like that. That is nothing to do with the blue light hazard. The terms have been used interchangeably, but it's nothing to do with that. So one of the bigger problems uh, for modern generations is we spend a lot of time indoors, often under less than ideal lit environments, when we have evolved as an outdoor species. Uh, so we spend all day in, the, in this, um, uh, in this case, a dreadful uh, office environment, and then we go home and play with uh, our, our mobile technologies, etc., and potentially uh, don't have a very good uh, circadian entrainment. Uh, just by going outdoors uh, in most parts of the world at midday is good enough to ensure that uh, things are all right. Um, and you're not going to have a blue light hazard just from being outdoors for a period of time. So we're still working on that. Hopefully Manuel is going to uh, get someone to speak a lot more about this in a, in a later um, uh, presentation. <coughs> but what we do know is at night, ideally you want a, a dark environment and you certainly don't want a product uh, like that. Um, this was on sale um, for your, your child's night light with a blue LED and uh, that certainly is not a, a good idea. So to finish up, I, I mentioned these uh, two position statements. Uh, they're free to download. Uh, the one on the blue light has, was published in April. And we have another one that uh, was published in October, the second edition of uh, recommending proper light at the proper time, which is giving some sort of description about the um, uh, issues to do with um, uh, lighting throughout uh, the, the, the day time and night time, et cetera. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening. Thank you, John. Um, we will now begin our question and answer session. Um, as a reminder, if you have a question for John, you can put it in the Q&A box and we will try and get to as many of these questions as we can in the time we have left. So our first question for you today asks, 
is the inverse square law applicable to viewing normal LED computer displays? No. It, um, if you're a long way away from your screen, then yes. But uh, if you're close to the screen, it's roughly uh, one upon uh, D and not one upon D squared. All right. So moving on to our next question, they ask, how hard is it to get ethics approval for studies with human subjects staring at light sources for long periods of time? If you cannot or do not need to design an experiment with humans staring at light sources directly, do you extrapolate from other data to identify exposure limit values? I would say it'd be very difficult to get ethics approval to have people staring at very bright lights when you think they might have a problem with that. Uh, it's obviously a lot easier to get uh, approval for animal studies. Um, and the, tr the difficulty is extrapolating. Uh, from our experience, over the decades that this research has been done, by using animal models, you end up with a pessimistic uh, um, conclusion. So people probably are not as sensitive as some of the animals used in the studies. But of course, it might be completely different. Okay. Our next question today asks, would you please provide a reference for the blue light action spectrum? What is the rationale for the exposure durations that integrate over time for limit, the limits? And is it presumed that retinal pigment cells recover from damage overnight? Okay, the first bit is easy. That's um, if you go to icnirp.org, icnirp.org, you can download the um, ICNERP guidelines for visible light and infrared, and you'll see the action spectrum in there. It's, it's presented both as the graph as I've, I've shown it, but also as a table, so you can do your own analysis of this. Um, the exposure durations are partly um, in terms of uh, photochemistry and partly in terms of where you, your limit is better presented as a rate rather than the total. Um, so that there is a, this change over at 10,000 um, seconds. And yes, it is presumed that there is recovery. If you get exposed at the limit every day, then you're likely to have problems. But if you're below that limit, there's a, a reasonable amount of recovery. Obviously, over your lifetime, you do uh, um, have damage that builds up just from life. Um, which is why if you, if you have a, a retinal examination, they'll, they'll often find something. Um, but uh, uh, in, within the reasonable exposures that we get, it's a bit like vision. It just recovers overnight. Great, thank you. And I think that actually that, addresses yeah, that's, that's up, that one as well, yeah. A couple of questions here. Um, so our next question asks, how about high dynamic range displays? They get very bright. Uh, comments on that? Well, the, 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 the light source, I mean, 4,000 candelas per meter squared, yes, it's a very bright light source. I, I think it comes back to common sense. Uh, if you're required to stare at a light source all day long that's that bright, I think you'll find it quite uncomfortable. So I, I think what would happen in, in the end is that, um, well, I wouldn't do it. Is, is the honest answer. Uh, we don't generally like to stare at very bright light sources. You try reading a book outside in bright sunlight and um, you, you find it very uncomfortable. You find a way around it. Mm -hmm. All right, our next question asks, how are the eyes affected from using light treatment for delayed sleep phase syndrome or seasonal affective disorder? Uh, I wasn't going to go there. Um, this, this really is a, a subject for, I think, a, a talk that uh, Manuel is going to arrange for later on. Um, but they, these effects are completely different from what we're dealing with in terms of blue light hazard. But what I will tell you is people who use blue light treatment for seasonally affective disorder, you do not exceed the blue light hazard. Okay. And so moving on to our next question, does optical design software such as Code V offer a designer a hazard overlay to act as a set to verify the impact of the output of the system designed to the end user? I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. Okay. So moving on, do you have any comments on horticulture lighting where blue and red LEDs are used to grow plants, but people are also present in the same space? Okay, this is, um where you have occupational exposure, 
then there needs to be a risk assessment. And being in a particular color environment is unusual for us. Um, they should not exceed the blue light um, hazard, uh, but you'll find if you go outside, uh, and people who work in these environments will tell you that the world is very strange to go outside. Uh, so again, common sense says it's not a good idea to have people in those environments all the time, but it's difficult to prove that it's actually harmful. Okay, our next question asks, if you can clarify your statement on blue lights contribution to AMD, is it that non-sun blue light sources do not contribute to the development of AMD and that sunlight exposure may, or that neither sunlight exposure nor other blue light sources contribute to AMD? I think the bottom line here is we don't actually know what, what is causing it, but it's almost certainly very high light levels, probably considerably above the blue light hazard. So if you are in an environment where you're getting continuous images of the sun uh, um, on your retina through being on water or snow, um, then that is probably not going to be a good idea over your lifetime. Um, but uh, if, if you had extremely high level um, light sources that emitted the spectrum similar to the, the sun, then the, the, I would guess they would cause the same problem over your lifetime, but you just wouldn't want to look at it. And it, of course it would exceed the limit, so uh, it should not happen anyway. All right. So moving on to our next question, it says some articles refer to a narrower spectrum for a blue light hazard between 450 and 455 nanometers. Would you revise the spectrum for blue light hazard? No. Okay. Um, will a new action spectrum for blue light hazard be defined, especially for young children or babies? Well, that's the aphakic um, action spectrum that I showed. I'm, I'm not aware that uh, that's going to change. We, the, as it's presented by ICNERP, it tends to suggest that it is very much for babies um, and uh, aphakics, but we have suggested that it should be used really up in, for, for children. So up to at least up to age 14. All right. Our next question today asks, could you explain the difference between the limits as a flux given in watts and defined as an energy given in joule? Right, well, they were, they were both uh, either irradiance or radiant exposure. So watts per meter squared or, or joules per meter squared. Uh, one is um, uh, up to, 10,000 seconds, we're talking in terms of um, joules per meter squared per steradian, and that is a total that you can have in 10,000 seconds. So if you, if you like, it's a bucket you can fill up with exposure. When you go beyond, beyond 10,000 seconds, it's a rate, and it's just a changeover to partly address the fact that uh, there will be some recovery uh, from the uh, any exposure earlier on in the time exposure. All right, so our next question today asks, do LED light sources have a greater temporal light modulation effect that others, than other sources of general light? In our experience, they do, but it doesn't mean that other light sources don't have it. Uh, incandescent light sources that have particular dimmer circuits do have temporal light modulation because an incandescent light bulb does have temporal light modulation, but it's not significant enough to cause um, health effects in most people. It, it is a wavy line um, uh, with a, a modulation depth of, of the order of 16% or something. But the difference uh, with um, LEDs is you can switch them on and off almost immediately. You can generate a square wave from them. And it seems to be that that we think is causing some of the problems. Um, of course, you don't need to do that. It's just, it's just that it, um, uh, some of the electronics are easier if you uh, have the temporal light modulation. All right. And I think we have time for one last question today. And that says the recent CIE statement on blue light hazard did not mention displays, only lighting. Why was that? And is there a possibility of an update mentioning displays? I think the reason why we didn't include them is that uh, we'd already decide they weren't a problem. Um, it's probably a good idea to include it and thank you for that comment. All right. 
Great. So on that note, we will wrap up the question and answer session. We had a lot of questions we were not able to get to today, but I will share those with John after the webinar as well. So he does get a chance to see them. Um, thank you everyone for taking the time to join us today. Um, please remember when you disconnect, you will be prompted to complete a quick survey. Um, and you'll also be able to download a copy of today's slides from that survey page. A copy of the slides and a link to the recording will also be emailed to you within 48 hours. I'd like to thank John O'Hagan for taking the time to present for us today and also thank our color technical group for organizing this webinar. On behalf of OSA, thank you all for joining us today. This concludes our webinar and you may now disconnect.